Sounds True presents Music as Medicine, Session 10, Melody and Transcendence, with Kay Gardner. Now that we've looked at harmony, let's move on to melody, which is more of a linear kind of harmony, which is the horizontal look at harmony, melody, the singing part of music, and how melody touches us. Up to this point, we have explored several elements of healing music. The first element, which is not the musical element, is intent. That the intent we put into the music, along with the sound, equals healing. And also, when we are creating music, if we do not state our intention and keep it pure, then the music is not going to be as powerful for the listener. We looked at the drone, the long, uninterrupted sound that touches us in specific places in our bodies. We looked at repetition and its ability to relax us. We looked at harmonics or overtones and how we can access the spiritual and how we can move them out of dissonance to help heal us at all levels. We looked at rhythm and how it duplicates the healthy pulse, and harmony and how we can access emotions and feelings with just the simplest intervals. It may be surprising to you that we haven't even touched upon melody yet, because this is the element of music that we probably most identify with. Have you ever listened to a piece of music and just been lifted out of yourself? The music has ended and you are out there somewhere. The music has just taken you out of any physical consciousness whatsoever. Melody has that power. The great composer Igor Stravinsky felt that melody was the most accessible to our ears. And he described that a composer's capacity for melody is a gift. Not every melody is capable of engaging the mind, the emotions, and the spirit. But melody, he said, in the hands of a gifted composer can take a listener into lyrical flight. Now, if we're not aware of our physical body when we're hearing a glorious melody or a line of musical tones, then we're not aware of physical pain at the time we are hearing this. So if you know of a piece of music that always takes you out of body, then the next time you have a headache, you don't necessarily have to take an aspirin. Just put on the piece of music and let that be your relief. Now, that's not to say that pain isn't important. If we don't have pain, then how do we know something's wrong? But there are times when the pain is so intense that we need relief from it. And I really feel that we can use music, music with beautiful melody, uplifting melody, to take us out of the physical awareness and away from the pain for a time. Fortunately, at this time, there are musical practitioners who are trained to play at the bedsides of people in hospital and in hospice. So where does melody come from? The ancient peoples heard the wind as it blew through trees. Those in the north heard the wind as it blew across the flows of ice. People on the plains heard it across vast meadows. People in mountains heard it in a different way. And they heard the sounds that their tools made. They heard the sounds of the animals. They heard the sounds of rain falling on hollow logs. All of these sounds made up the ancient people's scales or ways of making music. And since everyone lived in different geographic locations and the sounds of nature were different in different geographic locations, we have a lot of different scales from all different cultures. Every different culture seems to have a different set of notes that they put together to create melodies. And these are probably determined by the sounds of nature and the sounds of their own bodies and the sounds at different times of the year, different seasons, and the sounds of the tools of their culture. The ancient philosopher Boethius 
believed that there was music that was related to the cosmos, not to be heard by any human being, that there was music of the soul and the body, such as the chakra and the aura, also not for human ears, and then there was audible music created by the voice and by instruments. During my concerts, I often ask the audience to participate in dialogue, and once I was playing some flute improvisations, and a member of the audience asked me, well, is your music Apollonian or Dionysian, after the god Apollo and the god Dionysus? And I wasn't familiar with the terms, and I asked, well, what do you mean? And the audience member said, well, is it inspired by the dark forces or the light forces, Apollo being light and Dionysus being dark? And I said, well, I guess both. I guess it's the gray forces, the in-between gray. In the Greek mysteries, there are two legends as to the origin of music. The so-called irrational and emotional music is Dionysian and refers to sounds inspired by human emotion or animal cries. Dionysus was a Greek god of wine and orgiastic celebration. A myth telling of the goddess Athena killing the Gorgon Medusa recounts that Athena invented a musical instrument called the aulos, kind of related to the flute and the oboe, after hearing the cries of grief coming from the Gorgons who had lost their leader, Medusa. And the event was supposed to be the origin of what is called Dionysian music, though why they didn't call it Gorgonic, I don't know. The messenger god Hermes was said to have received the music from a more divine source. It was the harmonies of the universe. By stretching strings across an empty turtle shell, kind of like Pythagoras's monochord, but that kind of music wasn't named for Hermes. It's called Apollonian after the Greek god Apollo, god of music and medicine, and is said to be theoretical, rational, well-ordered, and serene. Well, if you read these ancient myths, it's easy to see that there's kind of some sexism inherent in them. The irrational music was invented by a woman, and the rational music was invented by a man. Here's a dichotomy that we don't need to honor in this age, as all music reflects heaven and earth, just by the fact that it takes human-made instruments and human voices or human hands to create it and human ears to hear it. In different cultures, musical scales are called different things. If we talk about the scale in the Western culture, we think about this. That's the one those of us who had took piano lessons had to practice every day. But there are many different scales all around the world, not just this one, not just what we call the major scale. In South India, there are more than 5,000 different scales. And what does this mean? That there are different sequences of tones. Some scales have one sequence of tones going up and a different sequence of tones going down. So the variety is infinite where in the West we use about 75 different scales. If we played that scale that I just played for you in each key and played the minor scales and played maybe a, added a blues scale, we would have about 75 scales that we use. Now doesn't this sound terribly limiting when we know that in the East there are 5,000 different scales to work with? As communications are opening up around the world, we are learning about these scales, and many musicians in the West are beginning to incorporate these world scales into their music. So in the West, we call the sequence of tones scales. In ancient Greece and in Middle Eastern countries, they're called modes. And in India, they're called ragas, although raga is much more than just a scale. We'll talk more about ragas later. There's a legend about the great Greek musician, the father of healing music, the father of geometry, Pythagoras, who lived on the island of Samos about 600 BC. And Pythagoras was taking an evening stroll and came upon a very disturbed young man setting fire to his girlfriend's house. And he noticed that the street musician was playing a very fiery mode, perhaps the Phrygian mode, which we'll hear shortly. 
And so Pythagoras quietly went over to the street musician and said, why don't you play the spondaic mode? Why don't you play a more gentle mode? And the street musician did. The young man put out the fire and walked away peaceably. Of course, this is just a legend. But I believe that the power of scales and the power of music can change how we feel and can change actions. In ancient Greece, the instrument was the lyre. And the lyre couldn't be tuned like a guitar. It only had one tuning peg. And so it didn't have a whole lot of potential. So if we go to our keyboard, and some of you are keyboardists, and those of you who aren't, just listen to the difference. If I'm just to play on the white keys, let's pretend that my keyboard is a lyre that has two octaves on it. You may use your keyboard to play these modes as well. You only need the white keys. The black keys don't even come into it. The Ionians used this scale, which is the scale we know now as the major scale. The Ionians also were known for inventing scientific method and scientific proof. This scale is called the Ionian mode after the tribe of people that is said to have invented it. The Dorians started their scale on D, if you were to play all the white keys on your piano or on your keyboard, on the tone D. The D would be your tonic. Dorians were also known for the invention of Doric arches, or the style of architecture known as Doric arches. Now if we go to the third note on our lyre, the E, and play from E to E, using E as our tonic, which is an interesting word, isn't it? If we're using it in reference to healing music, a tonic is something you take to feel better. Well, in musical terms, the tonic is the root or bass note that we rest upon, that we usually start upon and we rest upon at the end of a piece. So let's move to the Phrygian mode, which is built on the E, or the third string of the lyre. And this was invented by the Phrygian peoples, who also were said to have invented the use of fire to create metal tools from fire. And their scale is very fiery. In fact, if I'm writing a piece of music that's representing fire, I tend to use this mode. This mode still exists in the flamenco music that we know from northern Africa and Spain. See, this has a very different character than the Dorian. It has a very different character from the scale that we're used to, which is called the major scale, but is also the Ionian mode. The scale that's built on the fourth string of the lyre is called the Lydian mode, L-Y-D-I-A-N. Monique Wittig, a feminist historian, says that the Lydians were a tribe of Amazons that settled on the island of Crete. This particular scale seemed a little foreign to the people of ancient Greece because it has that tritone in it. So if you're using your keyboard, go from F to F. F is your tonic, all white keys. the tritone. Plato, in his book, The Republic, banned this Lydian mode because it was too female. So I play it all the time. Also, a very interesting thing about this scale is this is the scale that whales and dolphins respond to. Paul Winter, several years ago, used this in a piece about communicating with whales and dolphins. 
and his tune sounded like this. Another scale, the next one, on your fifth string of the lyre, or G on your keyboard, is the Mixolydian mode. But what's interesting about this mode is that there were no Mixolydian peoples. This mode was invented by Sappho, and Sappho lived on the island of Lesbos. So you make your own conclusions why this is not called the Lesbian mode. This is called the Mixolydian mode. But Plutarch, in 46 AD, when writing the biography of Sappho ascribed the invention of this scale to her. And the lesbian peoples, those who lived on Lesbos, were great travelers. This scale exists today in a lot of Appalachian music and Irish music. This scale isn't terribly foreign to us. We hear it in a lot of things. In fact, the mountain dulcimer, the instrument, the mountain dulcimer, is tuned to this Mixolydian mode. And now we move to the sixth tone on the lyre, and that's the Aeolian mode, A-E-O-L-I-A-N. The Aeolian mode still exists in today's music, and it's called the natural minor scale. So here on your keyboard, on the white keys only, is the mode built on the tonic A. a seventh mode, and this mode is called the Locrian mode. This mode contains the tritone as well as the Lydian mode, but it appears in a very different way. When I've been playing the melodies, I've been accompanying them with a root, fifth, and octave pattern in my left hand. You may have heard that pattern. If I did that with this scale, I would not be able to get a fifth because the fifth doesn't exist. It doesn't exist as a perfect fifth. It would sound like this. There is no fifth, and that is what makes this scale disturbing because the fifth gives us that comfort. Remember earlier we talked about the balance that the root and the fifth would give us if the root was an obnoxious sound that we would sing the fifth against it and that would balance it out. When you have a scale that can't be accompanied by a, a root fifth octave progression, you have something that doesn't have stability. And therefore we would not want to use this scale in healing music unless you want to start disturbing somebody and then move them to stability. But even so, the scale we learn in music school is only a theoretical scale. It was not a scale that was used a lot. And that was the reason why, that there was no stability to it. There was no perfect fifth in its makeup, in the way the scale is put together. In classical music, we spend perhaps two paragraphs of our theory books on these ancient modes. These ancient modes were believed by ancient Greek peoples to have particular powers, to touch us in particular ways, or each mode had an ethos. If you study jazz, yes, you will study these modes much more than if you study classical music. So in some jazz books or method books about playing jazz, you will find these modes and you will be able to work with them. But unfortunately, they have been lost 
for the most part, except in folk music where they still survive. And if you look at a map of the movement of peoples, I've always thought it would be a very interesting ethnomusicological paper to write where these modes went with which peoples. As I mentioned, the Phrygian mode moved to northern Africa and Spain. The lesbian and the Dorian modes moved to Ireland and Scotland. And then, of course, as those peoples moved here to the Appalachian area, those scales moved with them. And so many of our folk songs are in the Dorian or the Mixolydian lesbian mode, or Aeolian mode as well. The Lydian mode did not come west. The Lydian mode moved up into the Balkan areas. So you could trace the movements of people by the scales that they use as well. So the seven modes as we know them today are the Ionian, the Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Lesbian or Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian. And in the Middle Ages, 400 AD to 1450 AD, each mode had its own set of ethics. The Dorian mode, the one built on D or the second string of the lyre, was used for religious rituals and the, was the mode that's used a lot in Gregorian chant. It's very magical and serene. It has an exultation in its melody. We've heard the scale in the Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby. Now, the lesbian or mixolydian mode was used for open and joyful music. This was also used in religious chants in the Middle Ages, and it was extroverted and happy. Here's a little more of the Mixolydian or lesbian mode. For melancholy and quiet and dreamy moods, the Aeolian mode was used. It was intimate and poetic, and it brought a simple, sweet quality to melodies. This is the one built on the sixth string of the lyre. The Phrygian mode, as I mentioned, is used for dramatic and passionate music. It emphasizes inner sadness and sensitivity. And as I mentioned before, this exciting mode still exists in flamenco music. Here's another example of the Phrygian. Then that strange to the Middle Ages ears, the Lydian mode. The Lydian mode not only was banned by Plato, and it's an invention ascribed to the Lydian Amazons that settled on Crete. But you might notice that the artifacts on Crete are often of dolphins. And this music was said to be able to communicate with the dolphins and whales. So perhaps these Lydian Amazon priestesses were communicating through this Lydian scale. This scale has a very pastoral and lyrical temperament. It's very gentle even though it is a little strange to our ears. Well, why did we stop using these modes? Why is it that we only learned of it in passing? Well, the modes fell out of character when the character of melody changed. Ancient music began as a very simple expression, meaning that it only was one voice or one instrument playing it. In other words, like Eastern music, it was purely melodic. It didn't have any chords or harmony. And the mode's power was determined by the relationship of each of its tones to the tonic, or the central tone. Up until about the ninth century, voices sang in unison or in octaves. They didn't sing in harmony, even in the West. And my theory is that when the monks or the nuns were singing in their very resonant cathedrals and monasteries, that the stone walls emphasized the first harmonic. In other words, they would be singing along, chanting along on a melodic line. And over that melodic line was the natural phenomenon of the fifth happening almost above them. 
And pretty soon they started hearing it. And when they started hearing it, then they decided they had to sing it too. So a lot of the early chants, the harmony would be this parallel movement of the fifth. although they would have to sing it down an octave. And this is how Western harmony was born. We started moving away from the singing in unison and in octaves to bringing in that other sound, the next highest harmonic. And perhaps we were evolving as a people, evolving as a species, and then were able to hear that where before we couldn't hear it. As music evolved, melody became less important. Harmony began to determine what the melody would be. In other words, the bass voice sang the melody or played the melody and would determine what the harmonies above it would be. Therefore, melody was built on the bass line, on harmony. Melody was created from harmony, where, as in earlier times, melody was supreme and harmony took its impetus from what the melody was. So we moved into a whole shift. And as harmony became more important, the modes started evolving into what we call today the major and minor scales. And then strict rules were put down. Now, this evolution did not happen in the East. Melody remains supreme in the East. And harmony only occurs in relationship of the melody's different intervals to the tonic. But in the West, in my feeling, we took the wrong turn because music became less spiritual and less healing because it became more complex. And it's the gift to be simple. I want to play you several scales from around the world. You've heard the Greek modes. I'd like to play you some of the other scales and maybe discuss a little bit about Indian music, Eastern music. In India, scales are called ragas. Raga means that which colors the mind. That is the literal translation. And ragas are not just sequences of tones. Ragas are built on times of day, what the body is doing at certain times of day, whether they're devotional, ragas for work, ragas for lovemaking. Many different moods determine what a raga is to sound like. And as I said earlier, in South India, there are over 5,000 different ragas, 5,000 different scales. Half of them are named for gods, and half of them are named for goddesses. And the construction of the ragas is basically the same as the construction of the Greek modes. There are eight basic scales from which all ragas spring, and those scales are almost identical to the Greek modes that we've already discussed. But in Indian music, they went further because they went into exploring the potential of melody rather than moving into the direction of harmony, as we did in the West. Each tone in Indian music is an entity unto itself, a living being. Music is much more sacred in India than it is in the West. According to Dane Rudyard, when an emphasis is placed on a single tone, the melody is the cyclic unfolding of that tone. So melody arises out of the single tone, like a stem arises out of a seed. So the unchanging timbre of the tambura, which we heard earlier in the drone section, is the basis of Indian music. As it sounds the ragas tonic, it becomes the roots of that melodic plant. And tamburas, again, are usually tuned to the root in the fifth, and that dictates the tones that will form the raga itself. Each raga has a character based on one of nine sentiments, also called rasas, which literally means nine juices. The first is universal creative force, which is romantic or erotic. The second is comic, humorous, or laugh-provoking. Third is pathetic, loneliness, longing for a god or longing for a lover. 
The fourth is fury, excited anger like a thunderstorm. Nature, divine nature and fury. The sixth is frightening or fearful music. Seventh is disgustful or disgusting. The eighth is wonderment, amazement, exhilaration. And the ninth, peaceful, tranquil, relaxed. So all of these elements are considered in Indian music. A raga is much more than a sequence of tones. It's a rich, living experience. Here's the raga that we have spent much time with in this series, the raga Saraswati. And I have a little bamboo flute I like to play for this scale. I thought I had invented this scale because when I first started out researching the origins of some of the Greek modes, I thought, well, okay, since the Lydian mode was supposed to have been invented by women and the Mixolydian or lesbian mode was invented by Sappho, a woman, what would happen if I combined the two and put that tritone in it at the bottom, put the Lydian scale at the bottom, and the lesbian scale at the top with the flatted seventh, I would get this scale. Wow, I thought, I've invented this wonderful scale. Well, about three years after I was using the scale a lot in my music, I came across a wonderful book, probably the Bible of healing music, and that would be Peter Hamill's Through Music to the Self. And in this book, he described this wonderful scale from India. And there it was. It was the scale I thought I had invented. It was Saraswati. Eureka, I thought. This is wonderful. This existed before. It was a little blow to the ego, but there it was, this wonderful scale that I really, really identified with. It, too, though, is a woman's scale in that it is named after a goddess, the goddess of music and the sciences also goddess of creation and knowledge. The scale that is used most in the world, the most universal scale, a scale that appears in every culture from every continent, is the same scale that is in the black keys of your piano or your keyboard. It's called the pentatonic scale. Penta meaning five, five note scale. And this scale exists in African music, it exists in Asian music, it exists in Native American music. I have a set of pan pipes here, and I'll play you an example of this five-tone scale, the pentatonic scale. A few years ago, I received a commission to write a series of pieces for an educational series on Native American tribes, and I got some field recordings of the different tribes, and I noticed that the constant in all of them, the constant in their music, was the use of the pentatonic scale. And I also found something else, this is kind of an aside, that the music often started high and moved to low notes. In such an example, this isn't a real uh, Native American chant, but something like this. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, 
this descending pattern has been very fascinating to me. And I learned that the descending movement is calling spirit down to earth. And I also noticed in my research that all scales in their very beginnings, music moved in that descending movement, bringing spirit down into form, into matter, which makes it interesting to know that in Western music during the Middle Ages, music started more of an ascending feeling, that the scales tended to ascend up to the spiritual, like the steeples of a church, looking outside of oneself for spirituality, looking out to the universe, and that the pagan peoples, the most ancient peoples, found that bringing spirit into one connects us with earth. Just an interesting aside. Another scale that we use a lot in our culture is the blues scale. Here, too, is a descending scale. The blues scale, a descending movement. Does it sound quite the same when it's climbing? We don't really hear it in most music in that way. And the descent of this scale represents the wailing. The blues is a very healing scale, a scale that helps us heal by duplicating the wailing that we make when we're in grief or in deep sadness. A couple of other scales that I really enjoy playing, I'll just play shortly for you. One is the Middle Eastern belly dancing scale. I'm told this is called the Ashkenazi scale, named after one of the tribe of Hebrew peoples. And last but not least, a scale that I learned from a master flute teacher in Bali. This scale is called the Slendro scale, the six-note scale. There's a little Balinese tune. And with the Slendro scale, we come to the end of this section on melody. Familiarizing yourself with the different melodies will help you choose which one is appropriate for which time. But for the most part, melody helps us transcend pain. We can express it with such scales as the blues scale, but we can also use it in highly melodic pieces of music to take a break from pain and move out of physical sensation. This concludes Session 10. Our program continues with Session 11.